um, the night before my installation service, I couldn't sleep. It was in March. And as I was just thinking and kind of praying and processing, a face dropped into my mind. And it was funny because it's a face of someone I don't know that well, but I knew there was something there. And then the next morning, as I was getting ready to come downstairs for the service, I got a text from the face in my dreams. And he said, hey, I am praying for you. I'm excited for you. And I'm here if you need anything. And so I texted him back and said, I do. I need you to preach at us. Come preach at us. That's what I need. And so Russell Joyce is here this morning to preach the gospel. And he is a dynamic communicator. He, as I was watching him during the first service, I thought he is a young father. And he actually is a young father. He has young children. But spiritually, he's a young father. He's got a father heart for the church and for you. And um, he was a church planter in Brooklyn in 2017. He is now the national director of church planting for Foursquare, our denomination. And he and his wife, Anna, pastor Eugene Faith Center, which is conveniently in Eugene. That's why they call it that, I suppose. Um, And I just love his message. He also is releasing a brand new book in about a week, um, and I, it's here. I would love for you to pick it up. I think after you listen to him, you're going to want to grab a copy because the message is beautiful about finding God's love in our wounds. So he has an incredible message for you this morning. Will you please welcome with me my friend, Russell Joyce. Oh, thank you so much. And can you guys also extend that applause to your pastor, Pastor Bo? I, um, there's many reasons when I heard that Bo was becoming the senior pastor here at B4 that I was so excited and um, overjoyed and eager to see what the Lord had in store for this church. But top of the list, and it was just reaffirmed this morning, spending just a brief amount of time with her and allowing her to pray over me as I prepared to preach. Pastor Bo loves Jesus. I don't know about you, after pastoring through COVID, I just wanna be around people who love Jesus. Anybody love Jesus in the room? I just wanna be around people who love Jesus. And hey, if you don't, if you're like, I'm not so sure, you're in the right place too. This is the right place for you. Um, I am so honored to be with you guys. I'm so honored to be here. Um, And uh, yeah, we're gonna take some time. We're gonna look at a passage, a story from Genesis, Genesis chapter 16. And one of the things I love about the Bible and our God is no matter where you're reading, it's actually a fun game. Uh, No matter where you're reading, you're gonna see Jesus pop up. (laughs) He's everywhere. Uh, I remember St. Augustine famously said, some paraphrased, uh, that the Old Testament is revealed in the new, but the New Testament is hidden in the old. You see him everywhere. And so we're gonna read a story today um, that is about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, but it's also about you and it's about me. And most importantly, it's about Jesus. Hey, also I'm from the South, so there's no invisible wall here. I like a lot of amens. I got some amens. It's about Jesus in here today. Awesome. Uh, So yeah, we're gonna be in in Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, which we'll get to in a second, tells the story of Abraham. So if you don't know who Abraham is, Abraham is who God shows up uh, after Noah didn't work and he decides that he's gonna try a new plan. He's going to make Abraham into a great nation. He's gonna make Abraham into a great nation. He's gonna bless him. He's gonna multiply him. He's gonna give him land. He's gonna give him tons of descendants. Um, he's gonna do something incredible through Abraham. Um, not too dissimilar. I mean, maybe not the same level of promises, but not too dissimilar when we all met Jesus. I remember I was 11 years old at First Baptist Church in Cary, North Carolina, and uh, I, uh, I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my heart. I said I wanted to receive him. Did I know what I was doing? Eh, maybe, you know. Uh, I knew the, the alternative that was painted for me. Baptists paint a really good picture of the alternative, and I didn't want to go there, but I also knew that there was something so special about Jesus. I have two little boys. I am a young dad. Pray for me, please. George is three and a half. Simon is two. And um, we have a little storybook Bible that they, they enjoy. Simon's favorite story is the zoo one. That's what he likes. Dad, read the zoo one. 
Noah's Ark. George's favorite story is the lion and the bull one, which if you don't know where that is, you'd be forgiven. That's Revelation 4 with the creatures around the throne. And I said to, to George, I was like, hey, George, I actually, I don't think it's a bull. I think it's an ox. And he goes, no, dad, it's a bull. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they love those stories. They can't sit through them, though. They can't sit through them. The one story, and I don't know what this means, but the one story from their storybook Bible that they are silent and paying attention is the crucifixion story. There is something there that they're just like, and, and I, I think it's because it's true. I Personally, that's my belief. I think there's something, even at our young ages, that we can't articulate the mysteries of faith, but there's something about Jesus that our soul goes, I know that man, I know him. So I was 11, I said yes to following Jesus. Did I know what I was doing? <laughs> no, not a clue. And yet, yes I did. Abraham had a similar experience. God showed up and said, go, leave your home, leave your family, leave your father's house, I'm gonna bless you. And Abraham said, okay, I'll go. And the thing about following Jesus, if you have an experience that you will, is that sometimes God says things to us which are beautiful, but then he just doesn't happen to say those things to anyone else. So God showed up to Abraham and said, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna multiply you. But Abraham's lived experience as he followed God into the desert looking for the promised land was not multiplication was not blessing. It was actually a different sort of math. Uh, he experienced subtraction. Leave your home, leave your father's family, leave your people. He experienced division, because everywhere he went, a fight broke out. And he experienced addition, because he and his wife, Sarah, didn't have children. And part of the promise was that they were gonna have more descendants than grains of sand and stars in the sky. And so presumably, though it never makes it clear, I have to assume because he's called the father of faith that it wasn't because Abraham and Sarah weren't doing their part. So they had day after day of trusting the Lord and believing his promises and believing he's gonna show up. See, here's the things that you learn about faith. Like when you're young in the faith, you think faith there are these big grand gestures, right? These big risks, like, Moses, you know, with his staff crossing the Red Sea, or you think faith is like Joshua marching around Jericho before it crashes. It's Peter stepping out of the boat to go after Jesus. And, and to be sure, there are moments in our lives, as there are moments in Abraham's life, where that is faith, these big moments of risk. But if I'm reading Abraham's story, most of his life were not big moments, big risk. Most of his life were holding steady and enduring with the promises that God had made to him and yet to fulfill. I don't know if anyone needs to hear that this morning. Faith may be a grand gesture. Faith most certainly is holding to God's promises when he hasn't shown up yet. And so for me, I gave my life to Jesus as an 11 year old and his words were kind and his, his face was gentle toward me. He said I had purpose, I was ready. And then I became a teenager. <laughs> and all the stuff that it comes with being a teenager threw my faith all over the place. But there is, in my story, and we all have unique journeys that are testimonies before the Lord. In my story, there was one other unique detail that was part of it. I was born with a rare craniofacial disorder called Golden Haar Syndrome. Uh, there's not many. Um, I don't have the specific stats, but uh, what it means is if you're born with Golden Haar Syndrome, uh, your face has different maldevelopments, underdevelopments, and so I was born without a left ear and my left jaw wasn't fully complete, my left cheekbone wasn't complete. And so I had lots of surgeries growing up. And, um, and when you're growing, also your bones are growing too. And so there was all sorts of distortions and all sorts of things. I, 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 had a, I just had one of those faces, you know what I mean? I just had one of those faces. 
Um, and so my experience, you know, was, was hard in places. I experienced bullying. I'd, I hated going shopping. I felt like I was always catching people staring at me with like an embarrassed look on their face that made me embarrassed. And uh, it was tough. I remember being in middle school and going at a party and playing spin the bottle and uh, the, the bottle landed on me and the, girl who had, the young girl who had spun it screamed ooh and ran away. And of course, it's one of those things like she's young, I'm young. There's so much grace. And yet, as we all know, you don't forget those things, right? Those things leave a mark. And so there's a sense where God had met me and he had promised good things to me and I followed him. His eyes were gentle, but everyone else's eyes were mean. His words were kind, but everyone else's words were biting. I wonder if Abraham felt the same thing of, Lord, I've, I've trusted you. Where are you at? I've trusted you. When are you showing up? How do I hold true to your words when things seem to be getting worse? It's in the middle of that story that we're going to pick up our chapter today. We're going to read in Genesis 16, which talks about Abraham and his wife, Sarah, still awaiting children, and Sarah's servant, known as the slave girl, Hagar, and how she's also part. And I wanna contend for us today that there's a little bit of Abraham that's inside of us, as I just set up. There's a little bit of Sarah that we can relate with too, and there's a lot of Hagar, if we'll allow it, that we can see. So let's go to it, Genesis 16. We're gonna read verses one through four and verse six, and then we're gonna work our way through it uh, today. So what it says, says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. Then Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar, and Hagar ran away from her. It's tragic. It's this really tragic moment in the story. And at first glance, it's hard to not like get a little defensive of Hagar and mean towards Sarah, and I get it. But before we do that, consider two things. Number one, this was actually the very common, very normative way of dealing with childlessness in the ancient world. I know to us moderns, there's so much of this story that we're like, I don't understand, and that's fair. But in the ancient world, this was super common. This was the normal, reasonable way. We can think about our own ways in our modern world of ways that we deal with childlessness that are just super common. This was the common way for them. So it's super reasonable for Sarah to propose what she proposed. And secondly, before we throw the first stone, notice that the author tells us they've been wandering for 10 years. 10 years waiting for God to deliver on his promise. That's 120 months. And I know there are people in this room who have probably had their own stories of infertility. So before we cast the first stone at Sarah, here's someone who has been faithful for 120 months and has yet to see God show up and is wondering, what is he doing? Wouldn't it be natural for us to say, well, maybe we misunderstood God. Maybe God is trying to do it through a different way. That's reasonable. We do that all the time. The problem with that is that we just read in Genesis 15 that that's not the case. One chapter before, God took Abram and he took him outside and he showed him the stars and he says, count them, Abram. And Abram goes, there's no way. And he goes, so will your descendants be through Sarah. I will multiply your descendants through Sarah. So God says it's gonna be through Sarah. And then he did something that's super amazing and super weird. Have you guys, anyone ever heard of the word covenant? A covenant, right? You see that, it's a biblical word. It means an unbreakable promise. An unbreakable promise. And covenants were also very common in the ancient world. And the way you formed one, this is the weird part, 
is you would take animals and you'd cut them in half. I know, I know. And you'd put the halves on either side. And then if there were like two kings, if two kings were making a covenant, a treaty, saying we're not gonna attack each other, they held hands and they walked through the pieces. And what it symbolically meant was they were saying, may it be done to me like these animals if I break this covenant. If I break this unbreakable promise, I'm gonna be like these animals, cut in half. Now the crazy thing about Genesis 15 is this. So God tells Abram, I'm gonna make so many descendants, I'm gonna bless you beyond what you can imagine through Sarah. And then he says, prepare the animals for the covenant, which Abram does. But Abram, there's this really interesting thing where Abram kind of gets scared and he's also sleepy and so he's just chilling off to the side and in a vision, we're told a fire from heaven passes through the pieces by itself. That fire is the presence of God and what God is saying is, Abram, I'm making an unbreakable covenant, an unbreakable promise with you that I am gonna do everything I've promised I'm gonna bless you immensely through Sarah. And also, it's gonna be through my power alone. You're not walking through these pieces. Because you, Abram, you're you're gonna be unfaithful. You, human being, you're gonna be unfaithful. But me, living God, I am completely faithful. And I'm trustworthy. And it's gonna be on my power. So right here in Genesis, Genesis 15, God goes, it's gonna be through Sarah, and it's gonna be through my power and my strength. And immediately in Genesis 16, we see that Sarah thinks, well, maybe it's through Hagar and maybe it's through my wisdom and reasoning, not God's power. And the author is just wanting us to see all the ways that sin so easily affects our condition. Like we can see ourselves doing that, can't we? We can see ourselves acting reasonably God has promised certain things, but it feels like our world, our society is doing things differently. Maybe even other Christians who call themselves, you know, like, I don't know, I don't wanna cast judgment. And we think, well, maybe it is supposed to be this way. Maybe I did mishear God because he hasn't shown up. This is the elements of our sin. Sin are the ways that we try and find life on our own strength the ways we try and accomplish God's promises ourselves, and we make a mess. Because who's caught in the crossfires is Hagar. Hagar who's abused, Hagar who's hurt, Hagar who's sent away into the desert, who runs away, but really because she was treated so horribly, it just anything would be better than this. And I know this as well. So 11-year-old me gave my, my heart to Jesus, heard kind words, good words, said, huzzah, let's follow this guy. Teenage years were hard. Took shots, wondering, Lord, where are you? And in the midst of this, me being a sinful human, I developed my own coping patterns to deal with the gap between God's promises and my lived experience. I developed a ferocious work ethic which sounds good, but it wasn't. It, wasn't it, was, it was not noble. I didn't rest, and I had a work ethic because I felt so ugly and unloved for who I was, but I realized in, in my world, in our world, successful people get love. So if I can work hard enough and be successful, then maybe people will love me. I also developed this sense of a, ze- a zeal in religion. So I was so devoted to my religious practices, to prayer, to learning, to everything, but not because it was birthed out of being loved by Jesus and I wanted to be with him, but because I wanted to earn his love. I wanna challenge us. It is so easy for us to do what we think God wants from us, but not because we know he loves us unconditionally already, but because we're trying to earn his love. I also had other coping, like, like boys, I, I found internet pornography and that was such a hook in my soul for a long time, through my college years. Because here was this cheap alternative to true intimacy, because there I never was told no, no one ever screamed ooh at me and ran away. All the various ways, all the various ways we deal with the gap between God's promises and our lived experience. And it feels reasonable in the moment, it seems to make sense but what it does is it makes a mess and we hide, just as your worship leader shared, we hide. 
And in my case, here's how I hid, and it was so interesting. I had forgotten this till recently. I was recently back on the East Coast visiting my family, and my mom pulled out my old school photos, kindergarten through, I don't know, 18-year-old. I don't think I've ever looked at my school photos. <laughs> I don't know if that's a boy thing or not, but I've never looked at them. And, uh, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was really revealing in his good sermon material. Um, kindergarten through fifth grade, you see little Russell staring at the camera, you know, just cheese him, you know, there we go. But sixth grade, I saw the first iteration of what I would know to be my tick all throughout my high school years until I got into college. And it was this, so the camera's staring and instead of me staring it down, face on and, and smiling, my face went like this, I went, boom. I just turned it slightly. And then seventh grade, it was a little bit more. Eighth grade, it was more. By the time I got to 10th grade, I kid you not, it felt like a full profile. I was so embarrassed, subconscious. I wanted to hide. Like Hagar, there were parts of me, and I dare say there are parts of you, if you're being honest, that you just wanna run into the desert and hide away from everyone and just let it die there. Just let it be forgotten. It hurts too much, too much sin, too much woundedness, too much shame. Just hide it away, it's safer. You and I, we're content with the world and with the life where parts of us are hidden in the desert and die there. But we sang a song, I don't know if you caught it. My gosh, this is where I'm gonna need you to say hallelujah. We serve a God who chases us into the desert. Come on. Come on, y'all. We're content to let parts of us hide in the desert and die. But our God is content to waste nothing from our life. We serve a God who chases into the desert. Genesis 16, verses seven through eight. The angel of the Lord found her. Oh. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Notice the parallel from Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve hid after their sin, what was the first question God asked them? Where are you? Hagar, who's running away. Hagar, where have you come from? Where are you going? A question that opens up. There's two things about this that absolutely move my heart so deeply. The first is this. This is the only time in the story she's called by her name. Only time. Now, we know her name is Hagar, the author tells us, but when you look at what Sarah calls her or Abram, she's always referred to as slave girl, slave girl of Sarah. She's not even referred to as hus or wife of Abram after she's given to Abram as a wife. She's referred to as slave girl. The only time she's called by her name, the only person who calls her by her name is God. And I think that's so beautiful and profound because we live in a world where no one calls us by our name. People call us what they want us to be. They call us the parts of us we present. They call us by that sin we did when we were 17 and they're never gonna let us forget it, don't they? Only the living God comes into the desert and goes, hey, I know your name. I'm gonna call you by your name. So you and I, guys, you and I, we have great sin. We have great pain. We have abuse. We have rejection. We have betrayal. We have addiction. We have neglect. We have all the consequences, all the fruit of this sinful world, and we don't want to listen to it. You know what we do? We do just like this story says. We push it down. We medicate it. We rationalize it. We deny it. We blame others. We blame ourselves. We over-spiritualize it. We just want to let it run away into the desert and die. And our God, the God of the Bible, goes, no, 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 no. I'm chasing, and I'm going to call it by its real name. How beautiful it is to hear your name called. And even, even, let's be honest, even the parts, when God says our name, the parts of us that we wish he didn't see, when he says it, when we know he sees it, it's still, we feel like putty in his hands. We know he's gentle. 
We know he loves us. He, he loves what J.R. Packer calls our realistic self, not our ideal self. You and I, we're presenting our ideal self to the world. God sees and loves and calls by name our real selves. And that hurts, but there's freedom there. That's where the freedom is. But he doesn't just do that. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't just call Hagar by her name. He actually says later on, he goes, hey, Hagar, I'm gonna so greatly multiply your offspring that they can't be counted. So your deep pain, I'm actually not gonna let it die. I'm actually not just gonna heal it, but what was intended for evil against you, I'm gonna turn to good and multiply it so much that you're gonna be blessed and people are gonna be stunned who this God is. If you let him, your deep wounds, your deep shame, your deep pain will not only not get the last word in your life, not only will it not kill you, but God will bring such healing and because God is the kind of God he is, he will produce from it, he will multiply it, he will use it in your story and testimony so that thousands will be blessed and turned to the Lord through it. That's our God. That's our God. For me, I was 16 years old and in Golden Har circles. We have lots of surgeries in our childhood, but there's one that in Golden Har land is known colloquially as the big one. And the reason why is because, as I said earlier, you grow, your bones grow with you, so there's a lot of distortions. And so when you're pretty much done growing, you have a surgery where they break everything. <laughs> they break all the bones in your face, and they realign them. They try to create as much as they can a semblance of a of um, a normative face. And so I was 16 and they, they broke everything. They broke lower jaw, upper jaw, nose. They took out skull and built cheek. They did it all, man. My face was the size of a basketball. That junk hurt. And there was a lot of physical pain, but there's a lot of social pain because I'm 16. The last thing a 16 year old wants to do is be locked up in a hospital or cooped up at home, feeling so alone, so unloved. In a way, it was my Hagar moment. It was a Hagar moment. I felt so unseen. I felt so invisible. I felt so abused. I felt so, so broken, so wounded. And it was this place that I wanted to die. I didn't want this, but I couldn't hide it. And I'll never forget, because it utterly changed the trajectory of my life. I woke up one, at one point in this after a nap. And my, my face was pounding. And um, my mom was usually in the room, but she wasn't there. And so it was kind of this existential moment that I think the Lord was orchestrating, where I felt so abandoned, so unseen. And, and just in this moment, I offered a prayer along the lines of, God, where are you? Lord, are you here? Do you see me? And in that moment, even though I don't think the window was open, a wind came, a gentle wind, and just rested on me and a love erupted in my heart. And I felt so loved by God and I started crying and I couldn't stop and I, I don't know if you've ever had a moment where God has drawn that kind of, that close to you, but I just felt like the gentle convulsions of his love and there was a knowledge that came up in me as if God was saying, I'm here, I'm here, I see you. I'm calling you by name, I love you, you are mine. You are precious, you are chosen. And it was such a powerful moment for me because I was living, my lived experience is that no one wanted to see this part of me. No one would call this part of me precious. No one would choose this part of me. And yet here was God saying the exact opposite. No, 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 no. In this moment, Russell, you are most clearly seen by me, most clearly loved and chosen by me. Here in this moment, and this is powerful because if God can love me in this moment, my gosh, he can love me in every moment. My friends, if God can love you in your worst, and he can, well, then he can love you in every moment of your life. He's trustworthy with it all. And that, that changed something. That was powerful. And I and you, if you're honest, if we're honest, that would have been enough, right? That would have been enough. Lord, thank you. You love me. That's enough. And in the Bible, it's never enough. God's got more. Turn to your neighbor and says, God's got more. God's got more. To the God who does immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine, he's got more. So here's how the story continues with Hagar. 
So after the, the angel of the Lord met Hagar, it says, so she, she meaning Hagar, she named the Lord who spoke to her. She named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Two things I want to say about this. Number one, there's a literary device in the Old Testament called a chiasm. It comes from the Greek uh, Greek letter chi, which is our letter X. And if you think about it, X marks the spot. You sort of come down this way, you hit the center, and you open back out this way, right? You're like, well, you left off the second part. Just go with me for this, okay? Well, there, that's a lot of Hebrew stories. They are chiastic in nature. They have details that come down. They have a center point that you, it's like the most important point, important point in the story. I'm getting too excited. My words are coming together. And then it opens back up and it mirrors the earlier points. Well, here's what scholars have found about the Abraham material from Genesis 12 through about 23 or 24. It is a chiasm. It's a chiasm. It makes an X. It has details and stories that go to the center and then it opens back up. And here's what's so incredible. According to some scholars, they argue that the center of the Abraham material the center of the chiasm is not Abraham. It's Hagar. It's Hagar. She's the center of the story. She's the most important point. And not because Hagar in herself is the most important point, but because God is revealing something about himself, which is the most important point. What is he revealing? Well, a couple things. First, you and I, we're content with the world where parts of us just die. God, Christianity is the story of a God who refuses to let any part of your life be forgotten or die. No part, if you'll let him. If you'll let him, that's a big if. You gotta let him into the desert. He'll find you, but will you let yourself be found by him? That's big. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. The first thing this tells us is that the center of your story, the most important parts of what God is doing in your life and in mine and in the world is found in the desert places. It's found in the most wounded, broken, ashamed places. That's where God is most clearly at work. But the second thing that this tells me, and this is wild, guys, this is wild. If it wasn't wild enough, this is wild. There is only one person in the Bible, one. Everybody say one. Only one person in the Bible who gives God a name. Everyone else, Moses, Abraham, everyone else, they announce, God announces his name. Call me this, call me this, call me this. There's only one character in the entire Bible who goes, I'm gonna call you this. And he goes, as you wish. Who's that character? Hagar. Hagar names God. The Egyptian abused slave girl, Hagar, gives God a name and God goes, I like the sound of that. Absolutely. I'll keep that name, Hagar. There is something profound about the idea that the place where you most encounter God most see God and most have authority to join in relationship with God, even name God, is the place of your deepest woundedness, shames, and brokenness. The desert place. That's where God is most clearly seen. And how do I know this? I know this for one reason, because she names him El Roy. El Roy can be translated two different ways. You could translate it, the God who sees. And that's true, and that's fair. He is a God who sees. But the other translation, and I think this is what Hagar is doing. He's the God who sees me. Imagine Hagar in the desert. No one saw her. No one. No one. And God shows up and loves her. And she goes, oh my goodness, I know who you are. You're not just the God who sees. There's plenty of general gods in this land who see. You're the God who sees me. My friends, 
Our God is not a general God. Our God is a very personal, very particular God. He's not just a God who sees, though he does. He's a God who sees you, 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 you. And lest you be tempted to disbelieve, seize the parts of you that are dying and wasting away in the desert that you just wanna die there. That's who he sees. That's who he's chasing after. And here's what's so amazing, if that wasn't amazing enough. I think in that moment why it's the center is because that's the moment of the cross. See, when I was, uh, when I was 16, when I was 16, and at least for the last couple of years, I'd been angling my face, which was like this personification of what I didn't want anyone to see in my soul. And when Jesus came into the room, when God came into the room and loved me and convulsed me with his love, it's as if he grabbed my face and he pulled it. He said, no, 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 I want you to look at me, look at me. Ah, oh, there he is. There's my son. There's my child. And in that moment, I knew God saw me. He forced me to look at him. But you know what's crazy? In that moment, I also saw the Lord more clearly than ever before. Because I was looking right at him. And here's what's crazy. He looked a lot like me. And here's what I mean. Who else knows what it's like to be in excruciating pain? Who else knows what it's like to be stared at and disgust and shame? Who else knows what it's like for people to scream ooh and laugh and run off? Who else knows what it's like to be mocked and ridiculed and abandoned by your closest friends and family? Who else knows what it's like to feel ugly and alone and forgotten? None other than Jesus Christ on the cross. See, here's the power of the gospel. When you let God, this general God, meet you, in your specific, precise moments of deep pain and wound. What you discover, he's not a general God. He's a very personal God. And oh my goodness, he looks just like Jesus. When you join God in those crucifixion moments in your life, you discover that he was there first in his own. And when you meet the living God in the places of deepest death, you learn the good news that there is no power, no force, no principality on the face of this earth that can stop the love of God. Even in those places that you're like, there's no way. Yes, there is a way. He said it in Genesis 16. He said it all throughout the Bible. That's where Jesus does his best work. That's where he does his best work. Friends, my story which I write about, is actually not my story, it's Jesus' story. And if you'll let him, it's your story. Because it tells of all the ways that our souls don't want to be seen. All the way that our souls are cast out in the desert in shame, just wanna be forgotten, just wanna be looked over, left to die. But a God who chases and sees and names, and then as he names us and we see him, we realize, oh my gosh, Jesus was in this place the whole time. And when we realize that, a healing comes over us, a flourishing, a power, a freedom that we didn't realize we weren't that free until that moment it hits us. And when it hits us, guess what happens? He multiplies it. He uses it like maybe even asking a guy who has the story to tell his story in front of hundreds or thousands so that Jesus Christ can get the glory alone. So would you do this with me? Let's just take a moment of response. Just a moment. Close your eyes. And if you're willing, if you're willing, I wanna ask you to imagine a desert scene. Is there a moment that comes to mind from your story? Is there a version of you? A wounded, abused, broken, sinful, sinned against, sinful, wounded version of you that you don't want anyone to see, you don't even wanna look at. You're trying to tilt your face away from the camera. And maybe, just maybe, could you let Jesus meet you in that place and deliver to you the same words he delivered to me? I see you. 
all of you. I choose all of you. You will not die, you will live. And I will make you live. Come, enter into my love. Come know a freedom and a healing that you don't think is possible. So Jesus, we offer our deep wounds to you. We offer who we are to you. We know that you are trustworthy and faithful. And if we'll meet you in these broken places, in the center of our story, we'll see the cross come alive. We'll see the living God look just like Jesus. And we know that we will carry that name of Jesus with us all the days of our life. Thank you for this profound truth. Thank you for this profound love. Thank you that you're a God who sees us. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. It's called His Face Like Mine, Finding the Finding God in Our Wounds. And I just think it's really important. And we have it out in the back. It's an early bird special. I think July 13th is the release date, so you can grab it early today. Um, if you would like to receive the benediction, would you put your hands out in front of you? May you be people who are brave enough and tender enough to turn to God in your wounds in your wars, and your wins, to show them your full self 
and trust him to love you back. In the name of the one who makes everything new, we pray, amen. Okay, we'll see you next week. We love you. Come for welcome party next week and we will see you then.